Um, I'll be speaking today on some uh, recent work I've been doing on associations between religious uh, service attendance and uh, mortality, uh, depression, and suicide. And I'll begin um, this presentation with a few reflections on issues of study design and also methodologic challenges uh, that arise in this area. Um, after that, I'll go through the empirical studies using data from the nurses' health study, looking at depression, all-cause mortality, and suicide as outcomes. And then I'll make a few brief comments on the implications of this work um, for subsequent research practice, but then also for public health and clinical practice, which will also form part of our um, subsequent panel discussion uh, as well. Um, so the first um, piece of this presentation will be more uh, methodologically oriented. Um, it will perhaps be the most uh, technical part of what you see in the entire day today. The good news is you'll get it over with um, <laughs> quite quickly um, and, and should hopefully then be able to coast through the, uh, the, the, the rest of uh, the day. I promise there won't be too many equations, uh, however. Um, but I do think these, these issues of uh, methodology and, and rigorous science are extremely important in, in this area which is challenging to study. So I would like to begin there and I will motivate that by, by considering the existing literature on religious participation and uh, depression. Many uh, studies have found uh, uh, fairly strong associations between uh, religious participation and, and depression and uh, Koenig et al.'s handbook on religion um, and health. They report over 300 studies on this topic published since 2000. Um, of the 272 cross-sectional studies published since 2000, 63 suggested a protective effect, only 6% a detrimental effect. Of the 45 cohort studies since 2047 suggested a protective effect, only 11% a detrimental effect. So it does look like there's evidence that these two um, are related, religion and depression. Um, but interestingly, the vast majority, over 86%, are uh, cross-sectional. And this is potentially um, problematic because other research suggests that the effect might, in fact, go in the opposite uh, direction. A study published in 2012 by Maselko et al. showed that among women, depression at age 18 predicted subsequent ceasing of religious, attending religious services, even controlling for uh, baseline attendance. So it looked like there was evidence also for, for re reverse causation. And this essentially renders the cross-sectional data effectively useless for addressing these questions of causality because one could observe a protective association between religious participation and depression, not because it protects against depression, but because those who are depressed simply stop attending services. So it's very difficult to address these questions with cross-sectional data. Only about 14% of the literature uses cohort data, and if you restrict that further, um, to large cohort studies, which have controlled for baseline levels of depression, you're down to probably about five or six studies contributing most of the evidence um, on the causal relationships in, uh, in this area. Those studies do also suggest a protective effect. For example, a, a study by Strawbridge published in 2001 suggested that those attending religious services who were depressed were actually at increased likelihood of recovery from depression by about twofold um, uh, controlling for uh, baseline depression. But those, those analyses of Misalco and, et al. In, in 2012 do make clear that really cross-sectional data can't be used to address these questions about causality and that there may in fact be effects in uh, both directions. So more generally, in terms of trying to evaluate the evidence in this field of religion and health, we can perhaps um, put forward a very rough hierarchy of, of design. Certainly other considerations are important as well concerning um, uh, measurement and, 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 and sampling. But in terms of the, the design of uh, the, the study, the, the, the weakest really in this hierarchy is, are the cross-sectional designs where everything is measured at the same time. The next best would be a, a longitudinal or cohort study where we're able to also control for various other um, potential confounding factors that we think might affect the relationship. Um, better yet still would be to control for baseline depression as well in these studies, to try to rule out um, the possibility of reverse causation 
Better yet still, for reasons we'll be going through um, shortly, um, we can also control for prior levels of, of, of service, uh, religious service attendance, for example, in these studies. Not just looking at current levels of service attendance, but prior levels as well. Um, better yet still is looking at a whole trajectory of, of religious participation, of religious service attendance um, as well. The, the gold standard in terms of assessing causality is often considered a randomized trial, but typically with a subject matter like religion, um, it really isn't possible uh, to, to randomize. But, but my view is that in this field of religion, spirituality, and health, too many of the studies have been cross-sectional. These can be helpful for establishing that there is something to investigate. But if we really want to assess evidence for causality, um, we, we want the more longitudinal designs. So why does controlling for baseline depression help sort out this issue of reverse causation? Well, let's say we were interested in looking at whether there was an effect of service attendance on our outcome depression. And let, let's suppose for the sake of argument that there were in fact no effect of attendance on depression. But that depression itself led to people stopping attending services um, and also affected later depression. In that case, we would observe an association between the two, a protective association, even if there were actually no effect at all. By controlling for baseline depression, we are able to uh, potentially help rule out that possibility. We rule out that possibility provided that our depression outcome that we measure at the end of follow-up is only affected by current or past depression and not by sort of the whole trajectory of depression. If it's affected, if the final depression outcome at the end of follow-up is also, say, affected by depression not just two years later, but also four years later, um, then we'd want to control potentially for that prior depression as well. Alternatively, we could try to control for past service attendance, which would help uh, rule out reverse causation um, as, as well. Controlling for prior service attendance also is helpful in terms of establishing causality because for an unmeasured confounder, to affect the relationship between service attendance and health. If we control also for prior service attendance, that confounder, let's say some measure of personality, would have to affect current service attendance through pathways other than through past service attendance. And we'll come back to this point when we go through the um, empirical work. Um, so controlling for past Depression can help establish causality controlling for not just present but also past service attendance um, can also help. Perhaps even better is to look at the effects of a whole trajectory of, of uh, religious service attendance measures in their effects on the outcome. But this can be challenging if there's feedback between religious participation and depression. So let's say we wanted um, to look at the effects of religious service attendance um, what we'll be doing is looking at religious service attendance in 1996 and in 2000 on our final depression outcomes. The question arises, well, do we control for intermediate values of depression in our, in our regression models? Do we control for measures, let's say, of depression in, in 1998 if we were to try to address that? And generally, when we're trying to look at effects, the principles for doing this are first we want to control for anything prior to the exposure because that could confound the relationship. But we don't want to control for anything subsequent to the exposure we're looking at because that might be on the pathway. That might block some of the effect. The difficulty we run into here is that with regard to intermediate levels of depression, let's say depression measured in 98 between our two service attendance measures, if we don't control for it, then we have confounding of our measure for service attendance in 2000 and its effect on final depression. But if we do control for it, depression in 98, then we block some of the effect of service attendance in 96. So we run into problems both ways. Um, causal models were developed here at the School of Public Health um, by Jamie Robbins to try to address this problem. And these models work by controlling for confounding separately at the two time points using a weighting type approach or a, a generalization of a propensity score type approach, which allows us to control for intermediate depression when we're looking at our 2000 service attendance measure, but not to control for intermediate depression when we use uh, when we're looking at our um, service attendance measure in 96. And some of the results I'll be presenting will be applying these causal models. Um, so. Uh, the methodology portion is now, now over. You can, you can relax, and I'll go through the, 
um, results which uh, uh, emerge from applying these methodological considerations and these causal models to data from the nurses' health study, um, along with um, a number of colleagues uh, here at the, the School of Public Health, um, including my former postdoctoral fellow, Shan Chan Li, who's now at uh, Boston University on faculty there. We, uh, we published three, three studies this year in, in the medical literature on religious participation, service attendance, and um, depression, all-cause mortality, and suicide. Uh, the depression analyses used data from about uh, 50,000 uh, nurses followed up um, from 96 through, through, through 2008. We, uh, 96 was the first um, religious service attendance measure we used in these uh, causal models. The religious service attendance was reported every four years in the nurse's health study. Uh, we controlled for uh, prior service attendance, service attendance in 1992 as a covariate, again to try to uh, rule out these issues of reverse causation. Uh, depressive symptoms were assessed every four years as well um, in 2004 using the CSD scale and in 2008 using the geriatric depression scale. We made various statistical adjustments for dropout in these studies. We were able to, because of the Nurses' Health Study, which is a large cohort study that's been run here at Harvard since the, since the 70s and has very rich uh, data on, on a, a, um, thousands and thousands of, of, of nurses, we were able to control for a number of potential confounding variables in 92, including, again importantly, baseline service attendance and baseline depression, along with a number of demographic factors such as age, uh, race, ethnicity, geographic region, number of socioeconomic factors, employment status, education level, census tra uh, track income level, uh, so social support, including marital status, having friends um, to support oneself, a number of baseline health measures as well as health behaviors, including physical uh, activity, alcohol consumption, smoking status, um, and, and, and so on. So we were able to control for uh, most of the important uh, confounders in this relationship, uh, but I'll come back to this point later on. Um, so what we see here are the results from fitting this marginal structural model. Um, this is looking at the effects of religious service attendance in 2000 and also independently in 96 on depression in 2004. Um, if we begin with 2000 and look at the um, odds ratios here, we see that for those who are attending services increasingly, never versus less than once a week versus once a week versus more than once a week, we see an increasingly protective effect where those who are attending uh, more than once a week are about 29% less likely to develop depression subsequently by 2004 than those not attending uh, at all. Uh, when we look at a, a continuous depression score measure, we see again um, an increasing effect with increasing levels of uh, religious service attendance. So a fairly large effect on depression, nearly a 30% decline in the incidence of depression for those attending uh, regularly. If we look at religious service attendance in 96, all of the confidence intervals do um, in, in include one. It doesn't look like there's much of an effect here, but it almost looks like the relationship uh, is, is, is perhaps in the opposite direction. What this ends up doing is it, it, it obscures the, the, the actual patterns and trajectories. If we look at the two more closely jointly, um, the following patterns emerge. For those who are consistently attending um, at least weekly, um, they're at either 20% uh, um, uh, reduced odds of self-reported um, uh, depression or 29% um, or, uh, reduced odds of um, severe depressive um, symptoms. Um, and, and, and there does seem to be a, uh, a similar effect in 96, but transitions, it turns out, are more likely to increase depression. So those who um, are attending and stop attending are at higher likely, likelihood for depression. And those who um, um, aren't attending and start attending, they get the protective effect of religious service attendance, but sort of the uh, detrimental effect of the transition. And so the odds ratio for that group ends up being um, uh, about, about one. So we, we see once again a protective effect of religious service attendance, possibly up to about 30% reduction. Um, uh, but, but there is also this effect of, of transitioning on increasing uh, the likelihood of depression. We also, with this data, looked at the effects in the reverse direction. Does becoming depressed lead to um, greater likelihood of ceasing to attend services? 
Um, when our outcome was service attendance once or more per week in 2000, um, depression, uh, sorry, in 2004, depression in 2000 was associated with a considerably reduced odds of attending services. And even depression in 1996 looked like it was independently associated with an increased likelihood of um, ceasing attendance in, in 2000. Uh, four, so that even if depression had, one had recovered from depression in 2000, being depressed in 96 would still lead to a slightly reduced odds of continuing to attend uh, religious services. And so we were able, using these causal models, to look at the effects in both ways and I think provide fairly substantial evidence for effects in both directions. We were able to control for a number of potential confounding variables here, but this is observational data. We have not randomized, and so there is some possibility that we still might be subject to unmeasured confounding. Um, sensitivity analysis is a way to assess how strong would that unmeasured confounding have to be to explain away uh, these relationships. So for something like personality, which we haven't measured, something like conscientiousness or agreeableness, which are associated with religion, and at least conscientiousness also associated with depression, um, to what extent could that explain away these results? And to explain away the estimate, that odds ratio of 0.71, that 30, 29% reduction in the likelihood of service, uh, uh, of, of depression for those regularly attending, that would require that uh, um, some unmeasured factor would have to both increase the likelihood of attendance and decrease the likelihood of depression by, by 2.1 fold each to completely explain away those results. So fairly substantial confounding would be required. Moreover, because we've controlled for past service attendance, that personality factor, conscientiousness say, would have to affect current attendance by increase the likelihood of current attendance by two po twofold above and beyond um, past attendance, so independently of past attendance. So pretty strong confounding would be needed to explain away this relationship. We can never be certain with observational data, but the evidence here um, is quite strong. So the study was able to um, confirm what had already been reported in the literature in, 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 in at least five or, or, or six large cohort studies with control for baseline depression. Um, but we were able to use better study design here with repeated measures on both religious service attendance and depression, larger study, about 50,000 women, and methods that were specifically designed to handle this issue of feedback. We did, again, also find an effect in the reverse direction as well, that those who are, be, are depressed are more likely to cease attending uh, religious services. And, and this may be just as important of a result, one which has important implications for uh, religious communities, to know that those who become depressed are more likely to cease attending, which might exacerbate depression yet further. Um, further reflection would be needed, but uh, I think uh, religious and pastoral communities could try to extend a further support to such persons who become depressed before they end up leaving. Allowing for feedback and accounting for both directions gave us insight into these dynamics. So that was our study on depression. I'll now go through um, somewhat more briefly those on mortality um, and, uh, and, and uh, suicide. Um, the design for our study on mortality uh, was, was fairly similar. We used these um, causal models as well as traditional proportional hazards models to look at the effect of attendance on um, all-cause mortality over a, a, a 12 or 16 year uh, follow-up uh, period. Um, the results from the proportional hazards model again suggested some sort of dose response relationship where those who um, were attending increasingly more often religious services were at an in uh, increasingly uh, large protective effect against mortality. Um, so those attending less than once a week were about, uh, had a hazard ratio of 0.8 uh, seven, about a 13% reduction in mortality. Those attending weekly, about a 26% reduction. Those who are attending more than once a week, about a 33% reduction in all-cause mortality over a, 30, over a 12, uh, or I guess in this case a 16-year follow-up. Um, when we did sensitivity analysis, again, to explain away that association would require an unmeasured confounder, which both increased the likelihood of service attendance and decreased the likelihood of mortality by any cause uh, by 2.3 fold. So once again, fairly substantial confounding would be needed to explain away these results. When we applied this marginal structural model approach to look at the uh, joint effects of service attendance in 96 and 2000, 
those who were attending regularly in both periods, both 96 and 2000, um, were at a nearly 50% reduced risk of dying over um, a 12-year uh, follow-up here um, from 2000 to 2012 um, than those who were not attending at all in any period. So these, these are now really very substantial effects on um, all-cause mortality. We also looked at what the mechanisms might be. Why is this association present? What might be explaining it? Um, much of my own research is on questions of methodology, specifically trying to get at questions of, of mechanisms um, and, and mediation. Um, we won't go through the details of, of the, 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 the uh, techniques um, here, but essentially what we tried to do to assess these mechanisms was control for our confounders in 92. Our primary exposure was religious service attendance in 96. Our mediators were measured in 2000. We looked at social support, smoking, depression, and a few others. And our outcome was mortality through 2012. And allowing this multiple waves of data, again, helps us address these questions of causality. Because something like smoking might both be a confounder. Prior smoking might make one more uncomfortable attending religious services. But it might also be a mediator, where those who attend um, religious services may be subsequently less likely to smoke. And by using the multiple waves of data, we were able to control for it as a confounder in 1992, but as a mediator in um, 2000. These were the results of the uh, analysis. The first column here is the proportion of the effect that we estimated was mediated by each of these variables in uh, 2000. Um, so perhaps unsurprisingly, um, social integration, social support uh, was, was an important factor, mediated uh, 23, our estimate was it mediated 23% of the effect on all-cause uh, mortality. So an important mechanism, but really only a quarter of what um, seems to be present. Um, another important mechanism here seemed to be um, s smoking. Those who were attending religious services were less likely to take up smoking. Those who were smoking and attended religious services were more likely to quit um, uh, smoking. And, and that explained in this data about 22% of the effect of religious attendance on all-cause mortality. I'm not sure one would find the same thing in Europe, um, but here in uh, the United States it does seem to be a, uh, another important mechanism. Uh, depressive symptoms seem to explain about 10% of the effect. Uh, optimism, likewise, about 10% of the effect. Using other data, we'll be examining um, other potential mechanisms that have been put forward in the literature, including meaning and purpose and self-control, uh, for which we did not have data on these measures in the nurse's uh, health study. But these probably also explain some of the effect of attendance on mortality. Um, Finally, uh, the, the, the last empirical uh, study we published this year um, was, was on suicide. Many religious traditions have strong prohibitions against um, suicide. Interestingly, suicide was also arguably one, uh, the topic of one of the very first uh, religion and health uh, studies ever, ever published. Um, uh, Durkheim, in his, in his book Suicide, examined um, religious affiliation comparing Catholics and, and, and Protestants and suicide rates found higher rates among Protestants attributed it to a greater social integration and social control amongst um, Catholics. Um, but his, his, his data were, was ecologic or group average. So there was no possibility of controlling for any individual level confounding variable and, and has been criticized on those grounds. Here we will be looking at associations principally between religious service attendance and suicide, but we'll also look here at um, denominational uh, differences in, in suicide. We also looked at those with um, mortality and depression, really found no, no difference between um, Catholics and Protestants, which were the only groups where we had sufficiently large sample size to make um, comparison. Suicide was the only outcome we've examined thus far, which we've found um, substantial uh, differences. Uh, again, methodology fairly similar to what we used um, uh, b b before, where service attendance in 1996 was taken as our primary exposure, and we controlled for service attendance in 1992, along with depression and mental health in 1992, to try to rule out confounding and reverse causation. Um, one limitation of, of um, this study was that um, there were only 36, thankfully, only 36 suicide events in this group of, um, in this case, about 100,000 
um, uh, nurses, but it does make the statistical modeling more, more, more challenging. Um, so we also used a, a statistical technique called exact logistic regression, which is intended to take into account small numbers uh, of, of events. Uh, our estimates were, were very similar with the two approaches. Um, the hazard ratio from the proportional hazards model suggested a hazard ratio of 1.6, so an 84% reduction in suicide, over five-fold reduction in the likelihood of suicide for those attending at least once a week. Um, the estimates were very similar with exact logistic regression. For an unmeasured confounder to explain away this association, it would have to increase the likelihood of service attendance and suicide by 12-fold, so sort of in, implausibly large. Something seems to be present here. Um, a similar effect size estimate uh, was obtained in one uh, case control study. There had only been one prior longitudinal study with completed suicide as the outcome rather than um, uh, uh, suicidal ideation or suicide attempts. And that, that study, unfortunately, was unable to control for baseline depression, which is, of course, going to be a very important confounder. We've seen that depression affects religious service attendance, and, of course, it has very large effects on um, on, on suicide. So here I, I do think the, the, the methodologic advance was quite critical in adding additional strength and weight to um, the, 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 the evidence base. And it's a large effect. Five-fold reduction is, is one of the largest protective factors for suicide that is known. Now, when we looked at these analyses stratified by um, denomination, we found a protective effect for both Protestants and Catholics uh, for Protestants, it was about a threefold reduction in suicide, a hazard ratio of 0.34. For Catholics, a Protest uh, hazard ratio of 0.05, a 20-fold reduction. Um, so protective effects for both, um, but a larger effect for, 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 um, uh, for, for Catholics. So essentially um, confirming Durkheim's result with, with individual level data, but importantly, only for those who are attending services. For those not attending services, um, there was no difference between uh, Catholics and Protestants, which would perhaps further support um, Durkheim's proposal that um, social integration, social control were the primary mechanisms. Uh, service attendance would be required um, for that. Uh, we tried to assess what the mechanisms um, might, might be, and, and we had posited, uh, once again, social integration, um, but, but also alcohol consumption and, and depressive symptoms. Um, for those attending less than once a week, the hazard ratio of 0.85 increased as we controlled for those to 0.94. So they did seem to explain some of the effect for those attending only occasionally. But for those attending um, once a week or more, um, those same mechanisms didn't seem to explain any of the uh, relationship, which we were somewhat surprised about. Uh, this needs to be taken with a grain of salt because we only have 36 um, suicide uh, events, but the, the difference was um, quite striking and might suggest um, that perhaps the, the moral belief that suicide um, is, is wrong is, is perhaps the primary mechanism. We don't have direct um, evidence for that, but perhaps some indirect evidence since these other seemingly plausible mechanisms, um, at least with this preliminary analysis, didn't seem to be central. So we've seen powerful effects of religious service attendance on depression, all-cause mortality, in suicide. Some questions that still remain are first, is this really religious service attendance or is that serving as a proxy for something else? Other aspects of religion or, or spirituality, what about um, other measures? And there aren't really adequate studies, longitudinal studies on specific religious beliefs, but there have been a number of studies on uh, religious or spiritual identity, self-assessed spirituality, religious coping, private practices such as prayer. Um, and in, in, in our data, and this has been similar elsewhere with, um, with uh, religion, spirituality, and population health, the dynamics, as we'll discuss this afternoon, are quite different at the end of life, but with religion and population health, it turns out that when you control for everything, service attendance still emerges as a powerful predictor, um, and the associations with the other religious and spiritual variables tend to get weaker or almost disappear when control is made for service attendance. So for population health, it really does seem to be service attendance that's driving it. Again, I think there are a number of plausible mechanisms, social support and social behavioral norms at religious services, such as at least in this country, um, not smoking, a consistent message about hope or faith, which may affect depression, optimism, purpose in life, um, conforming to rules and practices, which may increase self-discipline, consistent teachings that suicide um, are wrong. And I think it's sort of the combination of both the religious 
um, spiritual teachings on the one hand, but also the social element on the other and the mutual reinforcement that's leading to these fairly substantial effects. It's not really just through one specific mechanism, but the two of these combining, I think, my speculation, is what is leading to these um, strong effects. One does find um, effects for other forms of community um, participation as well, so religious service attendance isn't absolutely unique in that regard, but the effect sizes tend to be somewhat smaller, maybe a 20% reduction rather than in mortality, rather than a 30 or 35% reduction in mortality. Also, when we looked at other measures of, of social um, support, religious service attendance was, was far and away the strongest predictor of both um, mortality and, 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 and suicide um, um, compared to uh, being married, number of close friends, the number of hours spent with, with friends. Um, so, so there does seem to be, it, religious participation is not unique insofar as there are protective effects of other forms of um, social participation, but the effect does seem to be um, larger. My speculation would be that social participation that has not only shared meanings but also um, shared values, a sense of purpose, a vision for life, and a, a community that has existed over many years will likely have um, stronger associations with health um, than simply showing up, say, for a weekly poker game, um, which may still provide that social support but not some of the other mechanisms. Um, I want to briefly comment on implications of this work um, for, for, for future research practice and, and also at least raise the question of what are the public health and clinical implications of studies um, like this. On the research um, front, I, I, I think the, 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 the sort of challenges in studying religion and health and the feedback that um, can occur that does make this um, a difficult area to study and does suggest we really do need to focus on large longitudinal cohort studies. There are hundreds of studies, for example, on religion and depression, but my, I would argue that really only five or six of those contribute substantial evidence oh, out of hundreds. If you look at religious service attendance and life satisfaction, there are over 100 studies on this topic. I was only able to find one which used longitudinal data, 99% were, were cross-sectional. Um, I think this is the case in other areas of research um, which, which have sort of softer exposures or outcomes. There is at the same time a symposium on happiness today um, elsewhere at the School of Public Health and the, the, the situation is similar there. But it's not this way universally within um, health. If you look at studies on the etiology of breast cancer, it is not the case that you get 99% of the studies being cross-sectional. And I think the um, religion and health field could improve this way, that resources ought to be consolidated um, to, to allow for more large longitudinal studies. Perhaps the first study or two that's cross-sectional is important in making clear that there is something to be investigated, but if we really want to get to these questions of causality, we need um, more longitudinal studies. Those are the ones that really suggest strong evidence for a causal effect. In terms of the public health implications, we often assess public health impact as a function of, on the one hand, the prevalence of the exposure, and on the other hand, the size of the effect. If we have something that's common and has large effects, the public health impact is going to be substantial. Religious participation is common. 84% uh, of the world's population report a religious affiliation. In the United States, 89% believe in God. 78% consider religion a very important part of life, or a fairly important part of life. 79% identify with a religious group. 36% report having attended a religious service in the past week. So it is a very common phenomenon, and as we've seen here, the effect sizes are large. The public health implications, therefore, are profound. As one example of this, the CDC recently released a report indicating an increase in the suicide rate from 10.5 in 99 to 13 per 100,000 in 2014, a fairly dramatic increase. There was quite a bit of media attention. During the same period, the Gallup poll indicated a decline in religious service attendance from 43% in 99 to 36% in 2014. If we extrapolate the results of our study with the nurses to the general population, it would suggest that about 40% of the increase in suicide rate is due to declining service attendance. Um, I'm pretty much out, out of time, but I do want to raise this question of clinical practice and, and perhaps even more broadly public health um, practice. Is it reasonable to encourage um, service attendance? This will be a question that's addressed um, in the panel. There's been a great deal of discussion on this. Um, 
my own view is that the people, of course, don't make decisions about religion principally on grounds of, of, of health. Um, such de decisions and the way that beliefs are formed are shaped more by experiences, upbringing, values, truth claims, evidence, relationships, and so on and so forth. However, in my view, it does not seem unreasonable to me for someone who already identifies as being religious to encourage um, the social form of participation in religious life, religious community. We see the profound effects on, of, on health through those communal um, practices and, um, and, and, and again, far more powerfully than just with individual um, uh, practices or, or, or private uh, spirituality, at least in the population um, health domain. So it, I think further uh, reflection and ethical th thought is, is, is required and role of different healthcare providers or public health professionals may be different in this regard, but it seems to me that at least in some contexts, it's reasonable for those who are already religious to, to encourage and to promote communal forms of participation. That concludes my presentation. Thank you all for listening, and I will hand things over to the respondents. <laughs>